water first. Got to be healthy yourself. Uh, so uh, first of all, uh, good morning and uh, thank you, Jose, for your introduction. Uh, I can't wait to go to Brazil. The beach looks awesome. Uh, so I want to say, first of all, what an absolute uh, privilege it is for me to have the opportunity to be here with you today to share the story of uh, Bridgepoint's active healthcare approach as we consider and you consider uh, what is happening in population health around the world and what that really means for quality now and in the future. <clears throat> Now, I especially want to thank Tracy Cooper. Uh, you know Tracy as the charming, charismatic, and very determined president of ISQA. And I met uh, Tracy two years ago in Dubai when we were both speaking at the World Hospital Association, and she said, oh yeah, Marion, definitely, definitely have to come and talk to ISQA because I think the Bridgepoint story would be helpful and useful. And sure enough, you know, I guess about 18 months later, I thought at the time, oh yeah, sure, I'll hear from you. But I did, and uh, so thank you, Tracy, for uh, making those connections. Uh, in the tradition of the patient safety and quality movement, I've embraced this idea of storytelling as the way to approach the subject that I want to talk to you about this morning. Uh, and before I get right into it, I have a disclaimer. You heard from Jose's introduction of me that I'm not a scientist, I'm not a clinician, I'm really just the CEO that's on a mission. So there goes my poetry for now. Anyway, uh, although, I get my stuff sorted out, although I live in Toronto and I'm going to talk about my experiences in healthcare there and in Canada, my roots are actually a little bit closer to where we are today, and in fact, I'm half Scot. I originally hail from Newfoundland at the far eastern tip of North America, which is a good bit closer to Scotland than it is to British Columbia on the west coast of Canada. Newfoundland was the first part of North America to actually welcome Europeans when the Vikings landed there over 500 years before Columbus. But that particular international exchange never really took hold. For centuries afterwards, Newfoundland, and indeed the Americas, was uncharted territory. And as a proud Newfoundlander, I seem to have really taken on that status because I've spent my career working on issues in healthcare that also feel like uncharted territory. I started off my career as a social worker the first social worker in long-term care in Newfoundland in the early 70s. And I watched people for a short time being admitted to nursing homes permanently institutionalized day after day with demand and waiting lists growing exponentially. And you know, the thing I observed is there actually wasn't much wrong with most of those people. They were really in their, just in their 70s which actually used to be considered old when the facilities had been built in the late 40s and early 50s. And back then, it was just assumed that that's what you did when you got old. You went to a nursing home. It wasn't rooted in evidence. It was rooted in habit. Nobody had actually changed the definition of old people when life expectancy grew from 65 to 80. Nobody had thought through what health conditions make it truly necessary for someone to live in a nursing home instead of in their own home. And no one had even measured whether admitting people to these homes was doing them any good anyway. So like others around the world, I began to think we could actually do a lot better. The nursing home model was old thinking being applied in a world where a lot had actually changed. I was intrigued by the innovation of providing care in people's homes instead of sending them to live in institutions. Europe was ahead of North America on this. So at 23, I wound up being president of the first home care program in St. John's, Newfoundland, and then went on to kind of get that spread across the country. But for me in that home care program at that time, I was actually in uncharted territory. What we had to do then and what we have to do even more today, it seems, 
is to shift our way of thinking to fit with a new reality as our healthcare system gets better and better at helping people to live longer and with more chronic conditions. 30 years later, I think it's time for a new set of innovations, just as big as the idea that we could actually bring care to elderly people and to many other patient groups at home, rather than making these people go to live or to receive their care in hospitals or institutions. And this is now a global phenomenon. Fast forward from there, 15 years ago, I became president of what is now Bridgepoint in Toronto. Bridgepoint Active Healthcare, we call it. It's a public hospital, along with a primary care practice, a research and innovation collaboratory with a unique focus on not just chronic disease, but complex chronic disease. The burden of multiple or concurrent chronic conditions often complicated by poor social determinants of health. We actually changed our name from Bridgepoint Health to Bridgepoint Active Healthcare just this past year to really signal our absolute commitment to the active engagement of patients and families in their own care trajectory and to be an inspiration and a reminder to us of what patients have told us they want from us as a healthcare system and, and what they've told us about the outcomes they want for themselves. At Bridgepoint, we firmly believe that the challenge of complexity is the new frontier of healthcare, and it is largely uncharted territory. Bridgepoint's campus is actually quite near downtown Toronto, Canada's largest city with six million people, and it won't surprise you to know that we face all of the challenges that everyone from the World Health Organization to the OECD observes throughout the developed world. We have a rapidly aging population, not as old as Europe's, but getting there, with a growing burden of chronic disease in every single age cohort, increasing income disparities, increasing prevalence and diagnosis of mental illness, growth in obesity and related chronic diseases, and health spending growth that far outstrips economic growth, even though population health outcomes are improving only marginally, if at all. Toronto has the most culturally diverse population in the world. 46% of Toronto residents were born outside of Canada, and 47% have a mother tongue other than English. We have an urban Aboriginal population that tragically far out exceeds the rest of the population in every measure of disadvantage, from poverty to addictions. And the diversity of Toronto is greatest in the downtown core where Bridgepoint is located. Like in the rest of the developed world, our health system has been under enormous financial pressure for years, worsened since the 2008 financial crisis, and like many of you, we see more and more patients living with higher and higher burdens of chronic disease. And also, like many of you, our health system was not designed to understand, let alone address, these increasingly complex patients. To understand why that is, why we have such a mismatch between the needs of our population and the capabilities of our health system, I thought I'd reflect just a little bit, although I'm sure you're well acquainted with this story, but it's useful to reflect on how we got to where we are today as um, sort of a little bit of guidance about how we might get to the next place. So I don't think many people would disagree that the first part of the last century saw the greatest improvement in population health in human history in the industrialized world, at least. Clean water and better hygiene helped us conquer infectious disease. Better health care played a part, too, especially through antibiotics and immunizations. But this first wave of health innovation had its limits. Once your drinking water is clean, there's little to gain by making it even cleaner. These great advances in public health resulted in new challenges. As the incidence of diseases like cholera plummeted, 
cancer grew. People began living long enough to develop more cancer, more heart disease, and a host of other chronic conditions, and you know them all, but things like diabetes, CHF, COPD. We responded with a second wave of innovation, this time focused mainly on basic science and life-saving acute care. From the 50s right through to the turn of the century, science and modern me medicine turned its attention to understanding human biology, how to diagnose and treat things when they go wrong, and we've been very, very successful. In many cases, we also have the evidence to prove it. Once again, though, the second wave of innovation, in my mind, has its limits. And as a function of our success, many people are now finding themselves managing not just one, but multiple co chronic conditions. And the longer people live and the more successful we are at saving lives, the more likely it is that people will live with not just one, but multiple chronic conditions for a very long time. It's also, it's already happening, as you know, in Canada and elsewhere, as we've heard over and over again uh, in this conference. The majority of people over age 65 are living with two or more chronic diseases, and over a quarter are living with four or more. And this just isn't a problem for the elderly. Rates of chronic disease at, disease at every age cohort, including younger people, are exploding as well. One in four overnight hospital stays in Canada is for a complex patients, and each of these visits is about three times as expensive and intensive as a visit for someone with no chronic conditions. This is not a failure of our acute focused healthcare system, in my mind. The paradox is it's the consequence of our success. This fast-growing group of patients with complex conditions consumes enormous resources, for sure. In Canada, the 5% of our population with the most complex health needs now consumes 70% of our health care budget. A little over 1% of the population who have the most complex health conditions use an average of 55000 Canadian dollars a year of health care. And the worst thing is they're not getting good outcomes. And this challenge is growing exponentially as our population ages. And yet we treat complexity as an afterthought, or I think actually without much thought at all. The way we think about quality and the way we think about care delivery are still very much rooted in an acute-focused disease framework that was never intended to deal with complexity. If Atul Guan's framework holds true, for complex patients, we're in the pre-primitive stage of development. Now, as I mentioned, I was first asked to lead Bridgepoint 15 years ago, and the good news is that more through good luck than good planning, Bridgepoint had come to focus almost entirely on healthcare management and restorative rehabilitative care for patients with complex chronic conditions. The bad news was that I'd been hired to shut it down. The government of Ontario, our state-level government, had launched a program of hospital consolidations led by an expert commission, and the commission didn't see why we'd want to have hospitals focused on chronic disease and complexity. I'll spare you the details of what we had to go through to change that, but we did make the case that what's now Bridgepoint was ideally positioned to tackle complex chronic disease, the biggest emerging challenge to our healthcare system in the 21st century. Whether or not they fully believed us, they at least decided not to shut us down. And in the intervening 15 years, we've been on a long, slow path to build awareness, partnerships, knowledge, and capacity to more effectively respond to the needs of these new complex patients. In April, Bridgepoint's patients moved into a brand new state-of-the-art hospital designed entirely to meet the needs of people with complex chronic diseases. This is a first and pretty distinctive facility 
anywhere in the world. It required an investment of over a billion dollars from our government, a long way from trying to shut us down. And today, we've reorganized our hospital to be a resource for complex, case, complex patients and their care, caregivers, as well as our healthcare system as a whole. We've established what we believe to be the first research collaborative in the world, exclusively focused on understanding and managing complexity. We set up a primary care practice to model and to teach complexity management in primary care. And we committed ourselves to changing the world for these growing numbers of patients. Obviously, we're not done yet and we can't do it by ourselves, but we now have an increasingly clear view of the model of care needed for our most complex patients, and we're actually putting that into practice. We started our journey, like many of us do, by looking outside ourselves for guidance and evidence. We looked at leading systems and managed care organizations around the world, an approach to thinking that resonated with us was Kaiser Permanente's population stratification model, which I know you're all familiar with. But seeing this model about 12 years ago kind of was a moment of insight for us. We started to look at our own population and our own health system through this lens, and of course, one of the most ob obvious findings was the concentration of healthcare utilization but also the huge burden of illness that was being carried by a small number of people in our system and in our society, the 5% using 70% of resources. These, of course, are the people at the top of that Kaiser pyramid, and they're largely characterized by multiple complex ongoing health issues. And these are the patients we focus on at Bridgepoint. Now, after we found that model, we looked for other stuff, and there wasn't a lot. Apart from utilization data, here and in our hospital and everywhere, we knew very little about these patients. There was little, if any, evidence-based medicine, and there were virtually no clinical pathways, or as a colleague from Australia put it yesterday, there definitely weren't ABC sets for this crowd of patients. Virtually all clinical trials and most clinical pathways are built around patients without complications. You know, one example is we, we know for sure that 75% of stroke patients have multiple morbidities. And about 15 or so years ago, they were trying to do a classic study of hypertension in the elderly called SHEP. And they had to screen 400,000 people, 400,000 people to find 4,000 clean patients, people without complications to study. Now that's a classic study, but it's also a classic example that's repeated in most scientific studies. Typically, our patients are excluded because of their complexity and their comorbidities, even though they're growing in huge numbers and need our healthcare system and utilize our healthcare system the most. So to get better clarity and more evidence about what constitutes quality for these patients, we concluded that job number one was to understand these complex patients better. There was nothing in the literature, so we had to do research ourselves. We examined Bridgepoint's own population of patients as rigorously as we could, including a retrospective look at how they became complex in the first place. This work came to be called the Bridgepoint Study. The results of that study have allowed us to build a new model of care based on important findings about complex patients that we've now documented and published for the first time. These patients, none of you will be surprised, are characterized by clinical complexity on the one hand, we keep hearing that, high variability, multimorbidity, polypharmacy, high treatment burden, and fragmented care in our predominantly acute, reactive, highly specialized, and siloed healthcare delivery system. They're also characterized by social complexity, social vulnerability associated with poverty and unemployment, 
depression, addictions, social isolation, and real coping and adaptation challenges. We learned that the complex patient's journey often presents with a single chronic disease that's the tip of an iceberg. What appears at first belies the multiple layers of potential complexity that left unaddressed will erupt into a very complex patient. And furthermore, there are clear and obvious tipping points in each patient's journey of a clinical and social nature that provide real opportunity for preventative interventions if only we would do them. If these tipping points are ignored, and usually they are, at least in our population, they contribute directly to burden of illness and disability. And I would say they contribute directly to avoidable and preventable burden of illness and disability. This is a huge threat to the sustainability of health systems, but it's an even bigger threat to quality care and outcomes for patients. And while there's enormous upside in getting primary and secondary prevention right, and, and I can't stress enough that there is enormous upside, what we've also learned is we could do a much better job of providing great care and better care to those who already have complex chronic conditions, and there's a lot of upside in that too. In fact, the right care model would help us to optimize what IHI calls the triple aim, right? Outcomes, costs, and the patient experience. Innovating for complex patients is not like innovating in cardiac bypass surgery. Leading out processes is great, and so is avoiding unnecessary variation. But there can't be a checklist for complexity like the checklist for removing a gallbladder. The very meaning of quality and safety and what it takes to achieve it has not been fully considered for complex patients, and it's not the same as for typical acute interventions. If Atul Guan's analogy for typical patients being like a Boeing aircraft, fully loaded and too complex for man to fly alone, then the analogy for a complex patient, in my mind, is the bumblebee. I don't know how many of you know this, but according to all the rules of physics, the bumblebee should not be able to fly at all. And yet, you know, this isn't an option, obviously, for the bumblebee, and it's not an option for complex patients. In complexity, we're not dealing with huge numbers of similar cases. We're dealing with large numbers in some cases, but usually smaller numbers of highly variable cases that present unique challenges. And in my mind, it's kind of like mass customization. The processes and safety pro protocols used for common single cases in acute care can actually create barriers and cause unintended harm in complex patients. And to illustrate this point, just last week, we had a really lively discussion at our medical advisory committee in the hospital about one of the required organizational practices that we're implementing on our complex medical care units to be in compliance with Canadian hospital accreditation standards. Now, this is not a criti criticism of Canadian hospital accreditation standards, but it's an illustration of kind of where we need to evolve to. One of the themes was the application of venous thrombo thromboembolism protocol. Now, the literature of this, in places very convincing, has all been conducted in acute care. Every few years, there's a huge, you'll know this better than me, greater than 300-page evidence-based consensus guideline printed in chest. And I guess good luck to anyone who can figure that out. But however, if you research the protocol, you will find there's a total absence of literature regarding the necessity, the efficacy, or the ethics of using VTE prophylaxis 
in complex patients outside of orthopedic patients who are completing their rehabilitation. In addition, our patients who are really highly complex are also clearly at risk or at higher risk for bleeding while on a VTE prophylaxis protocol. So if we treat all patients who are in a medical unit, regardless of the type of the medical unit, and if require that uh, as a required organizational practice, so if we treat all these patients with blood thinners, and then a number of those patients have serious untoward events due to hemorrhage, do we declare victory for quality and safety? Bridgepoint has taken the approach of calculating, in this case, to avoid risk, a thrombosis risk score, but also adding a bleeding risk score on each patient and asking all of our physicians to not just go blindly, but to use due diligence. And I know physicians would say they do that, but when protocols are in place and guidelines are in place and you're supposed to follow them, there is a tendency to actually do that. But we've been very clear to stress you're to use your own judgment in determining and making the decision to use VTE prophylaxis based on the risk scores and the overall clinic and clinical judgment. And we hope to, to be able to publish the results based on our data going forward so that we can inform and add to the knowledge base on the efficacy of these protocols in a subacute complex patient population. So just as managing a complex patient requires that we consider the whole trajectory of care in an integrated way, assessing quality requires that we place each intervention in a broader context looking at the whole person. If we treat kidney disease and ignore the heart disease, that's not quality care. We're still in the early stages. We lack a clear shared view on the right metrics of clinical effectiveness for complex patients, let alone the right ways to measure and manage them. Uh, some people would say that the challenge is daunting, but actually I think that the opportunity is enormous and we increasingly know key elements of what needs to be done. Once we understood who these patients were at Bridgepoint and the challenges they faced, we had to consider how we would develop a new model and new ways of addressing the needs of these patients to embrace complexity. Based on our own research on some best practices that are going on around the world in related areas, and our own experience in delivering care, we concluded that we really need to do things differently at three levels. First of all, at the level of the patient. What actually happens directly with that patient? Secondly, we need to think differently about how care providers and our healthcare delivery systems are organized and third, all of this needs to be fueled with real data, population, patient-centric data, and new knowledge that include putting complexity at the center of our work in research, clinical care, but also our work on patient safety. And the reason we need to do this is because of patients. Now, we this patient, Mr. McLeod, is a real patient from Toronto. He's a 66-year-old man who lived at home with his wife and his family. <clears throat> he had diabetes, failing kidneys, congestive heart failure, and arthritis. He was on 11 different medications. And one of his encounters with healthcare began when he got dizzy and fell. He noticed a painful crack in his spine and he found he wasn't able to walk, so his wife took him to his doctor who suspected that he'd fractured his tailbone. He ordered two tests at two different locations and physiotherapy at a third, all scheduled for the next week. But Mr. McLeod started experiencing more pain and more trouble moving, so his wife took him to the emergency department where Doctors did some more tests, changed a few of his medications, admitted him for evaluation, and then discharged him within days. 
After discharge, his pain was still so severe he couldn't go to the scheduled medical tests or physiotherapy. He was admitted for emergency care six times in the next eight months, not because he needed emergency care, but really because there wasn't something more appropriate for him. And eventually, he died in hospital waiting for a placement somewhere else. We call them ALC patients. I don't know if that's familiar to you. Alternate level of care, meaning there's nowhere appropriate for me to go. He never received a comprehensive assessment of his overall condition. He received care from a do dozen different medical specialties, few of whom ever talked to each other. He visited the emergency department, the most expensive source of care in the system, eight times, not because it was the best place, but because, as I said, he had no alternative. Despite receiving ne nearly $130,000 worth of care, Mr. McLeod's health outcomes continually worsened and his situation obviously deteriorated. Needless to say, he and his family had a horrible, frustrating, powerless experience at one of the most vulnerable times in their lives. So what are we doing or planning to do to change that, the experience of Mr. McLeod? Ideally, obviously, we need to see patients early before they reach a crisis that requires an emergent or acute care admission. That's where, when we're in the best position to avoid preventable acute care visits, but also unnecessary burden of illness and complications. The sooner we can intervene, the better. We all know that the future path for these patients depends more on their trajectory into complexity. This is something we learned in our study, and that really came out loud and clear. It depends more on their trajectory into complexity than on a single primary diagnosis or underlying condition. Through our research, we've, designed, we've defined a set of seven archetypes for these trajectories. These range from life as expected, people who experience the many illnesses and frailties associated with advanced age, to life interrupted relatively young patients who experience a catastrophic or serious medical event and who may, with the appropriate support, resume normal life. At the level of the individual patient, what we're working to change at Bridgepoint for all these patients, at the very least, is the slope, if not the, the direction of people's trajectories. To do that, we begin with a 360-degree assessment for every patient's health and context. So, you know, this is a, uh, a very complicated chart up here, but we say, you know, it's kind of like a Rubik's Cube. You have all of these different patient types, and for each of those patient types, what that assessment looks like, or typology, what that assessment looks like and what the program for responding to it, for addressing social capital, mental health, and uh, coping and adaptation needs, they're going to be different depending on how they got into complexity in the first place and what that means for their course ahead. And it also means that the types of programs and services that we need to uh, put together uh, obviously have to be tailor-made to the very different types of patients that make up this very highly variable uh, patient population that looks a lot like a Ru Rubik's Cube. So at the level of the patient, uh, you know, we are talking about, uh, I would say, mass customization is what I referred to uh, earlier in this assessment, et cetera. There's been talk for a lot of years right around our healthcare system about truly putting the patient at the center of the system. But actually, uh, I'm not a cynic, I'm actually an optimist. I just don't think we're close to really being there yet. But we're trying to do that at Bridgepoint by organizing ourselves to conduct assessments that look at the whole person and their, their environment from a genuinely interprofessional perspective.
and we're finally reframing uh, how to do that. This 360 degree perspective of the entire person with them at the center informing, you know, what the results of that assessment are is at the core of the Bridgepoint model. We work extensively with patients on collaborative goal setting and their own attainment plans. What is it that they want? What are the outcomes they want? And what are their aspirations for their lives? Involving them in decision making, not in any superficial way, but in a very meaningful way as the core decision maker on our team surrounding their own care. We provide support and education that is appropriate for healthcare professionals to provide. And we provide that to the individual and to the people who care for or live with these individuals because they're also a central part of our team and essential when it comes to the ongoing life support system that many of these patients require. We address issues of physical, social, and mental well-being and we put a huge amount of emphasis on strategies related to coping and adaptation. Most of these patients, minimally they have to cope to live with their chronic diseases, their complex health conditions, and a great deal of them also have to adapt, adapt various parts of their lives, not just, you know, putting a grab bar in a shower. There's a lot more that goes on in adapting to life, a different life with complex illnesses. Beyond the individual themselves, our study results also emphasized the need to provide a truly integrated care experience, one actually without handoffs for complex patients. In, in the research we did on tipping points, we saw again and again and again that many of these tipping points occurred at handoffs that were just badly done or not done at all or that actually went off course. So we're building a model that provides one-stop shopping, enrollment of complex patients for life, for patients uh, who are in our system with a view to providing an integrated and comprehensive set of services with, for these people with a particular emphasis on service in the community. Our hospital, you know, we're changing this notion of community hospital to turn our hospital into a resource uh, for and with the community. At the center of this is a partnership between Bridgepoint Hospital and Primary Care to take ongoing buck stops here accountability for all aspects of the complex patient's journey. This means networking together in a seamless way some services that already exist, like inpatient, complex health management and rehabilitation beds like ours, acute care, tertiary quaternary care, community mental health, and social services. It means filling gaps that exist in ambulatory, community-based, and home-based services, at least in systems like Canada's. I'm sure there's someone from Denmark who's thinking, whoa, what are they thinking? Swapping out acute capacity for community outpatient capacity is last decade's innovation. But in North America, uh, this is actually still fresh thinking. And doing it in a very comprehensive way, I think, is also fresh thinking. In the coming year, uh, we're actually launching a day hospital specifically tailored for patients with complex chronic conditions, along with a set of complexity specialized clinics where all of the specialists will be acting as one in an interprofessional practice. We'll partner with existing organizations to, who are delivering primary and home-based care, and in the long run, we anticipate expanding these services again with a focus on meeting the unique needs of complex patients. We're also allowing primary care doctors to admit patients directly to Bridgepoint Hospital, eliminating the need for an emergency room intervention and urgent care 
intervention or an acute care intervention while patients try to get to a complexity care providing organization. And to ensure true integration, we're also providing system navigation through dedicated nurse care integration specialists for these patients. Now, these aren't utilization managers, but health professions, health professionals who will have access to all of the services within the hub, but all of the services provided by any specialized provider within the region that this person needs. All patients in the hub will be enrolled and followed on a proactive basis. Now, we're not doing this in any paternalistic way, and we're not saying once you're in, you gotta keep coming for service. That's not the idea. The idea, though, is to create, you know, a bit of an HMO for complex patients where we have a contract with that person that will provide all health services that they require when they require on a, on a timely basis. Now, beyond the Bridgepoint Health System, uh, we think the rest of our system needs to make a lot of change to manage a world of complexity. And the best way to manage that, we think, obviously, or the best way to manage things like patient handoffs is not to have them at all. But at the very least, since we do still have different components in our system, we're looking to remove the barriers to create smooth tra smoother transitions from one care provider to the next and to communicate so that handoffs and transitions feel invisible to patients and families. For that to happen, the funding um, programs and incentives need to really support and reward earlier treatment and prevention, treatment in the right setting of care. And we know that's true for all patients, but nowhere is it more urgent than for complex patients that are the highest users and the highest risk populations that we serve. Ultimately, we need a more vertically integrated system with more elements of the care continuum for complex patients within the same organizations. Much of what we do today in healthcare policy, in our country anyway, you know, boils down to workarounds in organizations that are trying to address their narrow bits of the puzzle when in fact what we need are care providers that are fully accountable for the entire complex patient's experience. So at Bridgepoint, we've taken steps to encourage system change beyond ourselves. So one of the things we did in 2005, I thought we had a slide on that, I'm sorry we don't, uh, to though bring this front and center to policymakers and to the world. We declared there's a new disease out there. We did a whole public campaign. We said it's not just chronic disease, it's complexity. We said, you know, that new disease is things like neurodiabetes, osteocanceritis, and a host of other made up names, but, but conditions that naturally go together. We put posters all around City Hall and the House of Assembly, and we had them marked on every street corner in Toronto, and actually we got a lot of people's attention. For us, you know, this idea came from the fact that the situation of patients living with four, five, or six diseases all at once, you know, it's a growing phenomena for our health system, but it's really still uncharted territory. So beyond the other things we're doing, we, we now know for sure that we need data. We need the MDS for complexity. Uh, we need a lot more than that. We need much richer patient population health data. We have to push way beyond this idea of utilization data as the be all and end all. Uh, we need research and we need knowledge generation and innovation on how to manage complex patients. And we need uh, that work because it doesn't exist today. We also need to reconceive what quality and safety mean for these patients and how we actually measure it. What is the outcome we're looking for with complex patients? And that obviously means working with organizations addressing quality and safety like ISQA. The need for innovation 
and improved quality in how we care for patients like Mr. McLeod couldn't be clearer. And still we face some important barriers. Nobody wants Mr. McLeod in their study. He's complicated and it's messy. So we have no solid evidence of what actually works. So we're looking now to launch a whole other bunch of complexity studies. And we have to also work together to figure out what are the research methods that we can use to actually embrace complexity. Because the lack of evidence and data is a critical patient safety and quality issue. We don't know, and we simply don't have the evidence to know, the risk to a patient, right, who's got six or seven concurrent conditions. They're on 14, 12, whatever, different medications for diseases affecting multiple parts of their body. These are the patients that are least able to cope with unintended harm, yet were compromised from the start in delivering better, safer care to them now because we don't know what better and safer actually looks like. And even when we look at broader samples like the registries that are vital to the value-based healthcare movement, the focus is still on disease or a single intervention. We know a whole lot about what quality and safety looks like in cataract surgery and even in diabetes care. We know what facilities have better and worse 30-day survival rates from heart attacks, and we know a fair bit about what drives that. But we know almost nothing about what works when a patient with diabetes, Parkinson's disease, and a broken hip is on 14 medication and appears to be reacting not so well. This message is not just for healthcare delivery organizations and researchers, it's obviously for you, for our quality and safety movement. A central challenge for us in the global quality and safety world is to use a wider lens on quality, one that wherever possible embraces complexity as the next core challenge in healthcare, rather, rather than wishing it away. There's a whole population of people out there for whom the very definition of quality and safety is very different from what is needed in acute care and single diseases, and for whom the answers on how to deliver that are different too. Putting the right services and systems in place is not enough by itself. We need the knowledge to fuel those services, and we need the software that makes the hardware work. Many of you also, I know, reference yourselves a three-legged stool of clinical care research and education as the foundation for excellence in healthcare and in health service delivery. Well, as far as we need to go in clinical care on this whole area of addressing complexity, there's even more to be done to give complexity its appropriate focus in research and education. The research we've already done at Bridgepoint was hugely influential in defining our new model, but we remain in the early stages, and that leaves a huge opportunity. More research into complexity, the next unexplored frontier of healthcare knowledge and research. At Bridgepoint, we've chosen three priority areas. The first is population-based health service and policy research which is zeroing in on the profiles and needs of people with complex conditions. That includes, obviously, things like the social determinants of health, those trigger points I've talked about, and opportunities for prevention. It extends to the way systems have been built and how they need to change uh, to manage complexity, and it deals with things like our widget-based funding system, which can provide the right incentives to manage this population. The second area of research we focused on is technology and design innovation. We're really looking to figure out how tools and facilities can, and the built environment can impact patient outcomes and, and trying to inform how they should be designed from the perspective of end users. And we're carrying out one of the largest studies of hospital design, at least uh, in Canada.
Our third area of research is on clinical research, which is looking at the day-to-day -day treatment of complex patients and trying to define, you know, those care pathways or drive through, I guess, uh, this idea of creating some care pathways and clinical data sets that actually work. And we're taking advantage of the living laboratory of Bridgepoint Hospital to design interventions to optimize quality specifically uh, for this population. So there's no question that complexity is an area of growing interest worldwide, not just at one hospital in Toronto. We see complexity mentioned prominently in NIH presentations as the top healthcare challenge and here now at the conference. We have universities and acute hospitals approaching us about making complexity central to research and teaching rather than just listening politely to our pleas. And even politicians are beginning to see the links to sustainable budgets. And for our friends in the US, I might add that the challenge of complexity is about to grow even faster for you than for anyone else in the next few years. Uh, you'll understand better than any of us that the new Obama, uh, Obama health care law suddenly will be providing coverage for thousands and thousands of highly complex patients who might have previously been, been managed largely by limiting access to certain health services. So as you build a more universal system, many of your patients you're going to find with these conditions and you're going to have a unique opportunity to embrace this reality right out the gate. But the most important impact of Bridgepoint's model is on people's health. Uh, but there's also huge financial benefit, too. Our early work attracted the attention of Boston Consulting Group, and some of you may know them as a top-tier global consulting firm. And we did a whole bunch of economic modeling that demonstrated that by applying the Bridgepoint model, and distributing it just across Ontario, one of our states, we could save between four and six billion dollars a year, or over 10% of the healthcare budget. So I'm not gonna go on more about that, but I began by saying that complexity is uncharted territory in the way we deliver health services and in the way we measure and manage quality. It's not that we don't know it's there, the high utilization of a small number of patients is one of the most widely discussed topics in health policy today. But I believe we're in the early stages of rigorously exploring what really works in managing complexity and of, you know, putting it on that map. Bridgepoint is a small organization in the global health world. We have the advantage of being highly focused on adults with complex conditions. And I believe, indeed I know from our patients, that we're already making great progress. But there's so much more to be done. It's going to take a truly global effort. ISQA and the whole global quality and safety movement have a central role to play. Our quality movement began when we were focused on the last frontier of acute focus life-saving health care. So my plea today is let the time come to embrace comple complexity and the next frontier of healthcare, putting it at the center of our policy, research, and quality safety agenda. And thank you very much for inviting me. <laughs>